Hi, Tabitha. Hi, how are you? Oh, so good. It's been ages, it feels like. I think it's it's been about maybe a few years, but if these last few years have felt massive, like longer than normal years. <laughs> so it's yeah. felt or, or a lifetime ago. You yeah. take your pick. Yeah, exactly. So it's so wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining us on The Everyday Mystic. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited. Good. You know, and we had talked about doing a podcast uh, after we first met, and I was so excited about our uh, plans and getting that podcast off the ground and some things kind of came up in your life that it wasn't the right timing for you. And you, you stepped back from that project and you went in to take care of some, some real personal business. So why don't we start there? What, what was that, uh, like for you at that time when we kind of stopped corresponding? Um, yeah, my, my partner was really ill. Um, she was diagnosed in 2014 and, uh, really, really terrible diagnosis. We got through it, things got better and it honestly has been a roller coaster and was a roller coaster ever since. So a lot of projects like talking to you, I was so excited to do a podcast. I've always wanted to do a podcast. I still, I'm not there yet. We had such a great concept. I loved connecting and talking to you, but I also needed to be really aware of where my energy was going and where it was most needed. Um, and it was a really big lesson for me to start to learn to say no um, I can't do all of these things. I potentially could do them all, but I wouldn't be doing them really well. I wouldn't be serving me. I wouldn't be serving anyone else in, in the best way. Yeah, I was so glad that you that you made that decision because I knew that it was heart-wrenching, the time period for you and that um, and for you to choose to take that time for yourself and for your partner was a beautiful blessing to hear um, on my part, as much as momentum that we had, it was, it was really, you know, a, a beautiful happening that, that it went that way. And um, so, so from there, from, you know, you, I don't think we've actually even spoken, maybe we corresponded a little bit online um, from then. Um, so where's your life gone from, from that point forward? Um, honestly, my life has been in um, I'll call it a holding pattern because I can't find the right word for it. Um, as I said, my partner was first diagnosed in 2014 and she passed away last year um, mm. in June of 2022. So okay. it was a very long journey for her. Um, there were many different complications that came through that. I was there for her. So I really feel like now as I'm moving through the grieving process, as I'm moving through the what's next, as I'm rediscovering myself and who I am, and most importantly, who do I want to be in this next version of myself, um, which is the bigger question, is where things start to get frightening um, and delightful and delicious and juicy and all, all, of, those, all of those boxes are getting checked. Mm, yeah, that it is. It's it's frightening and fun, and it, the exhilaration of of the newness is is just. It is. It's a wonderful time to to be in this creative mode, isn't it? That you get to create and and really start flip a new chapter. Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry about your loss. Uh, I feel like losses are you've you've got the the whole bucket of or the the process of grieving but in that grief you get to pull out all of these beautiful um creative threads of you know like what what she left for you what you were um inspired by to and and move to do you know because of her life and and and, and even the role you played in her life as caretaker for all those years, you know, you, you've pro you probably learned so much about yourself during that period. Yeah, hundred percent. It was, um, the best, um, and biggest lesson I've ever had 
She was one of my greatest teachers. Um, she taught me so many things about myself that I did not know, nor probably would I have encountered or confronted or worked through um, or seen if it wasn't for who she was as a human, but also for the challenges um, that were put forward to both of us uh, with her illness and what came with being um, her caretaker and her mm -hmm. caregiver for such a long time. And yeah, grief sucks. There's, there's no good way through it. There's no fast way through it. There's no plan for it. Um, I'm choosing to celebrate because mm -hmm. I'm going to feel the pain. We're all going to feel the pain when we go through grief. That's part of it. Um, I have come to realize the pain you feel is the feel, the pain that you feel for yourself because it's your loss, right? I'm left here and I have lost the person I love, um, the person I take care of, my routine, all of those things. So I'm grieving for myself. I'm not grieving for her because she is now free from pain and back to being, mm -hmm. you know, expansive and just this full consciousness again, which is amazing. So I'm choosing to not get caught in that. I want to feel all those feels and acknowledge them and move through them. But I truly want to celebrate um, the incredible life she had, the lessons she taught me, and the fact that it's it's short here, right? It's a short amount of time. And I think when you go through that journey with anyone in your life, it gets you to put a different appreciation and perspective on the time that we have here and what truly is available to us. Mm. And do you feel like her uh, now that, cause you mentioned, you know, now she's part of the expansiveness. She's back. She's been called back to spirit. She is in uh, that place free of pain, uh, free of the suffering that she was experiencing. Do you feel her at all from the other side? Oh yeah. All the time. Yeah, all the time. I, you know, it's interesting. Um, part of my partner's illness, she had stage four brain cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and when she was first diagnosed, the doctor came out of surgery that was a 12 hour surgery and told me at best she would have 18 months to live. And I know um, that words are spells. I know that. And we need to be careful of the spells we're casting with the words that we use and how we choose to use them. And I told the doctor that I refused to accept um, his diagnosis, his prognosis or his expertise, that that was not something that I was going to let into my life. It was an impossibility. Mm -hmm. um, and that was how I moved forward. I didn't want to hear a statistic from a textbook. That was just impossible for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and as her illness progressed, she actually had a stroke and had severe aphasia. So as she started to decline, she lost the, um, ability to communicate and verbalize in the way that we do now. Um, so her and I had a language, we communicated. Mm -hmm. I was very in tune, um, psychically with her. I was very in tune with what she needed, what she wanted. I could tell and she could communicate with me without the stress of having to verbalize. So I feel like we do the same thing now. We still mm. communicate um, because we did that when she was here. Now we mm. just do it in a different form, which is actually really in the same form. I just don't see her anymore. That's the only uh. thing that's changed. What a cool gift that you, because it probably helped you accept that you were having this exchange with her. Cause I could see if someone hadn't had that experience in the human form of their loved one of reaching telepathy with them while they were still <laughs> alive, that it might be hard to accept it when they're, when they've passed, but you, what a cool gift that you got to experience that. And, and now you two can stay connected and, and in communication. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I think just, um, you know, again, it, it's where we all fall and what we believe, but I think we all have intuition. We all um, 
can tap into that and expand on that when we allow ourselves and when we drop some of the stigma and the fear and it can be such a simple practice to just get in tune with you and hear yourself so from that premise that makes sense that you can tap into other people that you can tap into other people's energy and you know thoughts and feelings and emotions and feel that and we know there are so many empaths out there that can feel the energy come come at them so i mean that is they're the gifts um sometimes the curses that that i've always had anyway and the things that were i'm really grateful it was a great way to communicate with her in a way that i still feel incredibly connected where did that begin for you as far as the deep intuition or empathy or empathic senses did you have you always experienced this since a child or did it develop in your later years no i always had it i was always an empath i as a young child i could always feel the energy around me even if i didn't know what to call it i could i could feel mm. um my parents bad moods or something was wrong without hearing anything i could just feel things when i walked into rooms and truly feel people's energy and pick up on it and i think when you're young you don't have the descriptors to be able to name it you don't know what it is yet um and when you tried to verbalize it which i would uh you know parents sometimes have a great way especially in that generation of just being dismissive right mm -hmm. or telling you you're wrong or you know you you don't know what you're talking about so i had those feelings um and then like many of us i think we just kind of bottle them down we don't know what to do with them we're not sure how to use them we're told that we're wrong we feel weird right there's always mm -hmm. also the stigma of judgment and feeling uncomfortable with some of those gifts so you kind of put them in a little box and they niggle at you every now and then and they knock a little bit louder until you're ready to um come into full discovery of them again do you remember the the moment or I guess maybe even the time period in your life when you started trusting that and and saying okay this is this is no longer something I can ignore this is real I uh, honestly I've dipped in and out I mean I've always again the intuition and the really strong gut knowing and do this even if I don't know why or don't do this even if I don't know why that that gut intuitiveness has always been very very strong for me um and when i have listened it has served me well in mm. in many ways and i haven't always listened and the outcome hasn't always you know been been as great then you're always left with oh i should have listened to myself i should mm. have known and it's i think it's developing that trust and it takes a while um now i don't question it now i just know even if i don't know why I know and I'm I'm okay with that. And I think for all of us it takes a while, um experience and practice to be able mm -hmm. to hear it more fully. Is there anything you do in your regular day-to-day -to, -day to hone the practice or is it just kind of like okay, the more I s listen when I get those intuitive hits the the finer tuned it becomes or is there anything you do that w is practical as far as fine tuning that um i meditate every day i mean i think stillness and quietness is really important nature is really important um quiet is really important discernment mm. is something that i think we should practice more and that i'm really aware of uh diet <laughs> you know i i try now i look at the things i do in my life um and i choose to do with how is this serving me in all areas how is this serving me you know mind body spirit what is what is this doing for me but i think one of the biggest practices is quietness and stillness mhm mm mm -hmm. Yeah, and that can be as simple as it is a challenging thing in, in our modern life, isn't it? To just shut everything out and uh, to take that time to do that is so, 
so profound and powerful and, uh, and hard, hard to maintain sometimes. So I'm so ha happy to hear that you're doing that, um, on a, on the daily. And then as far as, you know, you feeling connected to her and having still communication connection, um, is that the only connection you have to, let's say, a a spiritual guide or a uh, um, a voice or a, a power outside of you that you uh, that guides you, or do you have other other entities that you turn to or listen to on occasion? Um, no, I have other other things I turn to. I mean, I I'm not I'm by no means an expert, so I can't say, oh, it's this, right, that I'm invoking and calling in. I write a lot and I journal a lot. Um, interestingly, I don't read and I've just started to read what I write. Mm. I ask a question um, and typically the question is always the same. It starts the same for me is what is it that I need to know today? How can I serve the greatest purpose? Always the same question. It's how I start. And I meditate first. I ground myself. I connect in um, and make sure that I'm plugged in. And then I write. And I know that the messages that I write um, are meaningful and sometimes really profound and things that I don't actually know. I don't use words in that way, or I don't use particular words or string them together in the sentences that I, especially now that I'm reading them, um, that is just not the way I speak. My mm. handwriting even looks different when I do it, which is always really interesting to me. So, you know, I used to say, oh, it's, or tell myself it's because I'm not reading, you know, I just write, I just let my hand write and words come through me. Um, and then I would look and go, wow, my handwriting just look, doesn't look like mine. I don't write in that way. And now I don't question it. So I'll be honest, I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's a, if it's a different version of me, if it's my higher self, if it's a connection I have um, to a spirit realm. Again, I mm -hmm. don't, I don't question it. I think any, any of those, for me, any of those, gifts that we have and things we can tap into if they make us feel connected, if they help us, if they guide us, if they soothe us, if they have compassion and kindness and love for us. And that is what we feel when we're in any of these practices, then that is a good practice. Mm -hmm. And I love how you start that process of, you know, what asking those, that question and then putting it out to, to, for the highest, my highest purpose or my highest good. Um, so much can come in in that way. And I, and I completely relate to the, the channeling through writing. It's just a, a really, uh, I think a powerful way for a lot of people. And, you know, we're maybe of the generations where we did, we hand wrote for a long time, right? I don't, I mean, I don't, I didn't get a computer and, or even a typewriter, I don't think until I was in college. And, um, you know, so we grew up handwriting and now today, you know, so many uh, young adults and, and the kids growing up today, they don't write. And I think that there is a profound loss mm -hmm. with not actually, uh, there's something that happens between that connection uh, between us the, the writing and then, and then this connection to things that are outside uh, and coming through. And I don't know if you can channel in the same way through texting or, or typing. I'm um, not sure. I don't know. I think there's something very tactile. I think any practice, whatever it is, you know, even sitting down to meditate, there is a place I do it. There is mm. a process to getting comfortable and setting yourself up so that you feel supported, feel comfortable, love the environment you're in. If you have an altar or a special place in your home, um, that's tactile as well, right? And I think with many of these practices and many practices that 
truly do fulfill you and, and help you feel plugged in and connected, it is through that tactile connection um, mm-hmm. and looking at a box, right. And tapping, tapping on a phone to me, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like the, the, the slickness of it. Although I was just, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking, and I got this hit about, you know, the writing I've been doing, which is on a keyboard and I'm like, why well, fully channel as I'm typing, but that's, that is a very tactile yeah. instrument in a, in a lot of ways, but you've got these like screens that you're just, you know, moving around with your fingers and, and it, it doesn't quite give you that experience. I wonder if we'll get to that place though, where that won't even matter as a medium, we'll still be connecting in. I, mean, I want to go back to what you mentioned about uh, the altar, because I was actually going to ask you, do you have an altar? Um, and uh, having a place for for that ritual of meditation. Um, do you also do it at the same time of day or does it just when you're called? I try to do it at the same time. That's where the practice falls short because life happens. So I'm not I'm not as rigid with that. I know I feel better. Uh, morning is always great. First thing in the morning is always the best time for me. Sometimes the day just doesn't allow for that or the dog wants to go out or whatever is happening, you know, it doesn't get done first thing in the morning. Um, so I will do it later in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening. It's just making sure that I'm following through with it. So I'm not as rigid with those practices. I do have an altar, um, that I have set up in my office. Again, small things that mean something to me. Um, make me feel really good. For me, it's about when I see it, I feel good. When I see mm-hmm. it, it's a grounding, <sighs> right? That, and sometimes that's all it takes is just to come back in from everything that's calling us outside, just to look at something that makes us feel good or really take and appreciate that breath or just stop for a second and come back in and ground and then move back out again because we have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the moving back out, um, the, the process of, of that for you. Now you've created a lot of things in your life. You've, you've had a couple TV shows, you have a, a brand now where you're coaching and, and helping women to achieve their own, uh, life purpose and, uh, their, their highest good and, and purpose, um, and other creative projects, uh, that I probably don't even know about that you've, that you've embarked on and, and done. So what is it that, um, uh, takes you from, and uh, what is it that happens in you when you've got that spark of, Ooh, I've got to take this out in the world. It's something maybe that you cultivated internally. And then you're like, all right, let's go. This is something worthy of putting out there? Uh, It's always a feeling for me and I always let it process and it has to grow because not everything that lights me up is of service to other people. So I, the things I do, I always make sure that I'm really serving other people, not because I want them to change and do the things that maybe I'm coaching them about or suggesting to them all the ideas I'm sharing, because I do believe when you have someone there that can hold space for you in the right container, I don't carry anyone's baggage. So all I see is potential. Anyone Mm -hmm. I work with, all I see is their greatness. There's nothing else for me to see. Um, And again, I go back to words of spells So if someone's telling me, oh, I'm this, I choose not to believe that. I choose to Mm. only see your greatness and that is what I'm going to do to help you get there and help you see your greatness as well. I want you to see the reflection that I see. Um, And any time I put anything out or anything that I make as a suggestion is always with that in mind. Mm. Are there ways that you see into, you know, how, what do you think is your, could you describe your process of how you see into somebody past what they might be saying to you, past what they might be showing to you? (laughs) And how do you see into, into that potential? 
Um, I have a really good uh, BS meter mm. and I can see, and for me, BS stands for blame and shame. And I can see when people shrink themselves down because we all have where we don't want to celebrate ourselves or um, sometimes even accept how miraculous we are. We're all mm. living miracles. The fact that we're alive and walking this planet as the humans that we are means that we're a miracle. You know, the statistically it is challenging <laughs> um, to be a human being and to be here and to stay here. And we're doing that. So if we're given that gift, then we're already a miracle. And I think so many of us try and dull our light and not celebrate ourselves and not accept the greatness we have, because I think that is scarier than hanging on to the crap that we hang on to and the fear that we have mm. and the challenges that we've faced and all of those things, because truly to accept our greatness and the full potential that we could have, um, feels like a big responsibility for a lot of people because it is right. When you, when you think about it and I think that feels incredibly scary. So it's easy to hold that potential for someone else because they are the ones that have to do the work. I can't do it for them. I can help them. I can support them. I can guide them. I can be a bridge for them, but I can't actually do it. And it's not about mm -hmm. what I would want for them or hope for them. It's about what they want for themselves and what they choose for themselves. Mm. So again, we're always in control of it. It's always through our choices, our decisions, our discernment, our devotion to ourselves, um, how, how we move forward. Mm. Yes. You're, you're, you as an authentic person need to walk that talk yourself, right? Personally, in order to give that kind of advice and, and be that con container for, for clients and businesses that you've worked with. And I see that so clearly in you that you've, you've gone through the fire and you've, you know, so many people I, I talk to either in this realm or they're just my friends and, and that I surround myself with are, are the consummate wounded healer. You know, you're, you're providing this healing, whether, you know, it's not all hands-on or, mm -hmm. you know, health, physical healing, right? But healing to a person, a business, the world, um, a process. And it, the, the strength of that is, is, or the, the, when I see the, the strong healing energy from somebody, it's, it's usually from people that have, have been through the, the, the deepest traumas, the hardest, uh, obstacles that they've overcome and, and through and been burnished through that, that fire themselves. Uh, otherwise it's, it's like talking from a textbook. Right, you're just you know, giving the advice that is is you've not experienced yourself. Yeah, it, you but I think that's, that's how I do think it's true, and I think that's how you um, how you're a mirror for someone to heal. Right, I I can't heal anyone, but I can support you through your journey and your process, and I can show you. I can stand in front of you. Um, and tell you verbally or just the fact that I'm standing here that yes, I have walked many paths and had many traumas and worked through them. And I've come through the other side. That doesn't mean I'm a hundred percent healed. It doesn't mean I'm better, different than anyone else, but it means that we're all made of the same stuff. And we're all incredibly resilient and we're all incredibly strong and not everyone has realized that and tapped into that in themselves or tapped into the greatness um, of the cosmos and the universe and 
have a practice that they can help to anchor themselves into or have they had the support around them and the people that can model, show, help grow them and love them through it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I try what I try to do. I, yeah, I have, I've walked through the fire too many times um, to count and grateful that I get through to another side to heal one part and then experience those lessons and then be able to look at someone. And even if I don't know what they're feeling, I can see that pain or I can hear that underlying I, I don't feel I'm confident enough. Someone did this to me or someone said that to me, even without them telling me, I can feel that within them. Um, and again, I want people to see their greatness. Mm -hmm. mm. How is it that you're working with people these days? Cause I know on the shows you would, you, which for reality shows, obviously you've got production and, and I'm not sure how much of of how much you actually did get to work with those clients and, and see things through. Um, so now with what you do is, is this kind of like the dream culmination of the work that you've, that you've built up to, to now, or do you see it as just another rung in, in the ladder? Um, it's just another piece of the puzzle. I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful uh, for the time that I was on TV and the time that it was that I was on TV because it was a different landscape. So I truly did spend mm -hmm. all that time with those businesses and with those people, you know, mm -hmm. we would, oh, our cool. cameras would be up 14 hours a day and I would be with them 14 hours a day. So it wasn't a cut, let's break. It was cameras up. And as soon as cameras were up, I was there. And if cameras were up for 14 hours, 12 hours, I was there 12, 14 hours wow. um, and that was important to me and it also helped me to really get to know the business owners and the people that I was working with during that time because I was with them all the time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just walking in and out and that's what made what I did really special and I think that's what people saw when they watched it that resonated, that it felt true because it was true. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a different time now. TV is not made like that. So that, that wouldn't happen the way thing, things are made now. But for me, it was also realizing that it wasn't really about their business. It wasn't really about their profession. My, my passion and my profession is I'm a hairdresser and I loved my craft. And I love still practicing my craft, but it was never about the craft. It was about the human, mm. it was about the human not being able to overcome some of those internal challenges they had or communicate in a clear way and being stuck in these fear loops and limiting beliefs and all the things that were happening that I was really working on. And for the past 10 years, um, I, I'm a certified, trained master coach and I have many therapy certificates and things that I have been doing in the past decade um, to help refine my skills so that I could truly serve people in the best possible way and I could have the credentials and the training and the know-how behind me um, because that is how I like to be authentic. I don't tell you something just because um, I need to really know it and live it and embody it and work it or have moved through it myself. And to be honest, the time that I started my, my coaching career and getting my education and credential is when my partner got sick. So part mm -hmm. of it I did because I wanted to save me and I wanted to save her. And that is how I did it. Plus I was starting to step back from, I couldn't film a TV show anymore. It was impossible because our life had changed so much. I couldn't be on the road and do that and be away from her. I needed to be here to take care of her. And that is how I came into kind of the coaching lane, which I 
don't love that word, but <laughs> it's the word that we use, so I'll use it. Um, came into that world and got the got the uh, kind of the knowledge and the work that I did, and then wanted to work with clients and share it with clients and really empower people to take ownership of of their life, ownership of their businesses, ownership of themselves, um, to be happy. <laughs> to Mm. find joy, to thrive, and to really Mm. be the best that they could be. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to, you know, this, this whole idea of word spells, because you, you just brought up another one, you know, the word coach. And, and I agree with you that coach doesn't quite, it maybe is a bit old school or maybe masculine feeling, or I don't, it, it just, to me also doesn't necessarily encapsulate what you've just described that you do as far as hold space for people and help them see their authentic selves and mirror back to them their greatness. I mean, that to me, like, coach, uh, I don't know. It's it's too much tied to the sports world, maybe. Yeah, totally. So I agree, yeah, that that is not necessarily the the word. but, you know, this brings up word spells and, and our use of words again. And I know one of the words that was very much tied to you as a personality on TV was the word bitch, the concept of bitch. And I want to talk a little bit about, one, how you navigated those times, because in the time I've known you, that's not who you are, um, at least from our maybe popular you know, notion of what a bitch is. Um, So how did you navigate those times of of being associated with that very strong word spell? And then what have you done to reclaim that? Um, So when that word was being used at me and people (laughs) were putting that label on me and people were actually doing it to my face and saying, hey, you're that bitch from TV which was always so extraordinary because you could pick so many different words, hairdresser, Australian, blonde, right? There were so many different things you could say. If you didn't know my name, that was fine. But that was the word that people would shout across the road at me or Mm. through a department store, which was bizarre. And it was honestly incredibly painful because I didn't see myself as that word in now we use it in the cutesy way right now we say it to our friends hey bitch right and it's all very cute now but it wasn't cute then it wasn't cute to use that word then and it is a way to hold women back to suppress them to dull their sparkle to put them in a box or a way to make them feel bad about themselves when you don't agree with how they're showing up Mm -hmm. and that was a problem for me So I sat down and looked at the word and came up with my own acronym for it, which is brave, intelligent, tenacious, creative, and honest. Mm. And those words are part of the values and how I live my life. So once I had looked at those words and really they landed in me and I was like, yes, I actually am that person. That is how I choose to move through life. Then it took the sting and it took the stigma of that word away because I reframed it and I actually reclaimed it and made it mine. So then when people went, you're that bitch from TV, I could just smile and say, why, yes, yes, I am. Thank you. And keep walking because even if I didn't verbalize it to them, the words had lost their spell right? I'd mm-hmm. recasted another one and reclaimed mm. a meaning that was more comfortable for me. So um, I had written about it. I wrote about the reclamation of that word in my book. I'd posted on social media before social media was really a thing. And I did a TED talk about it. I was asked to do a TEDx talk about it. And it really resonates with people. So I actually developed a class that is called Bitch Camp. 
<laughs> it's on yes. the tenets of brave, intelligent, tenacious, creative, and honest. By the way, intelligence for me isn't book smart, although it can be. Book smart mm-hmm. is great as well. It is truly the innate, intuitive intelligence that we all hold inside ourselves and how we can tap into it instead of negating it and dismissing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a six week live class that I do that I work through. We work through those tenants and really reclaiming um, all those parts and pieces of yourself and bringing them and calling them back in so that you can move through life more brave, more intuitively with the tenacity, the creativity and the honesty that you need to face everything. Mm. Oh, what a what an amazing offering and what a beautiful personal story of just of of saying no. No, I'm I'm not going to accept that definition. I'm going to rewrite my and create my own definition and that's what I'm going to live by. And we can all do that, can't we? With any concept, any word, or really any uh anything in our lives, we can reframe how that sits within us, how that operates within us. Um, even just changing from one word to another, right? Uh, I was listening to a podcast last night and talking about, um, you know, just getting rid of using the word problem. Like, oh, I've got these problems. It's like, no, they're not problems. They're challenges. They're also opportunities and gifts, <laughs> really, right? Um, so just just flipping those scripts and and reframing in in a way that serves the highest good your highest good serves really everyone's highest good because that's the the that oneness nature of us isn't it that when you are in your power and in your highest good aren't we all or aren't we all going to be served by that 100% and i think that's why i No, I've said it several times, words really are spells and we don't have to accept the spell that someone may cast on us with their limitations and their labels and their expectations or their beliefs. We truly are free to cast our own spell and and to change it and we should do that and we should do that more and we should also realise that when we're using our words and we're putting them on someone else, we're casting a spell on them because Mm -hmm. they land and they stick. And if we think back to being called a bitch, the times that maybe you were a child that someone called you a name and even if you didn't understand what that name meant or what that label meant, you knew that it wasn't good, that it wasn't comfortable, that it didn't feel good on you but it was stuck to you because you didn't know how to pull it off and change it and reframe it and then claim truly what you wanted in your own agency that worked for you. And that's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, I mean, doing the things that work for you and spending that time really contemplating that all, which I, I, I love the, the, contemplative nature of the work you're doing and how you help people um, to really go in, go, go within and search within for, for those answers and search within for what, how they're going to reclaim. Uh, Because like you said, you can't heal them. You can't fix them. You can't, you know, rewrite their story for them, but you can give them tools to, to do that and, and some, some guidance in that, that way. Um, so tell us a little bit more about Bitch Camp because I know you've got one coming up and I'm not sure when it is. What are the dates? Cause I, it, hopefully it'll line up that this episode's released before the start of that. Oh, Bitch Camp, um, is not officially starting until the end of February. So there is time. Okay. I'm doing a free class Sunday. Uh, this Sunday, which is January 29th, 29th, um, which is something that I will continue doing as part of Bitch Camp. Um, I call them campfires, just Mm. campfire sessions where we can have conversations, people can get some tools and, and tips and tricks and 
ask questions and we can talk about the concepts of bitch camp and some of the things I teach, but then the actual six weeks will start in February. Okay, great. Well, I hope this is out before then. So give us a little taste of what people might experience at bitch camp. What are, I mean, we, uh, I understand the concepts in the, in the five areas that you cover. Um, are they meeting with you live online and, and what, what do, what would a participant expect to experience? Yeah, it's all live. Um, I, I love interacting and we need more community and we need to mm. show up more for each other. And I believe that doing, doing it live, not only am I showing up for the people that come and I want to make sure that I'm always showing up for them, but we're also showing up for each other just by coming into that container. We are accepting each other, supporting each other, rooting for each other, right. And really helping each other. So I hope that from that time, there are other sparks made and friendships made from that community online as well. Uh, so it will be every week, there will be a two hour um, session with me, Q&A, we'll work through the tenants of Bitch Camp, there'll be some um, exercises that I'll give everyone a workbook so that they can do some writing and do some contemplation on their own and process it for themselves. Then we'll do a midweek check-in. So there's a QA, and uh, celebrations, any challenges that come up. And again, I can just answer, answer questions and kind of give a week to di digest the information and work through it and some actionable steps that I would like people to actually put into practice what we talk about, not just listen to it, put it in your week, start to pepper it into your life. So it starts to become comfortable for you as well. And we'll do that through the entire six weeks as well as, you know, community again, the people that come to Bitch Camp, it's a closed community just for the participants. So they can chat with each other online, you know, share stories, celebrations. I'll jump on there as well. So it feels like it's a really supportive group. Mm, yes. Yeah. A transformational camp. Yeah. You know, something you'd want to, to uh, stay over at <laughs> and have, you know, talk, talk late into the night over the fire. Well, I love it. I'm so happy that we reconnected and I got to hear and, and that everyone got to hear more of your, your spiritual journey and uh, the, the spiritual nature of you. What, what really I, I feel is such a strong foundation of who you are and the work that you do. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Thanks for having me. It was so good to connect again. You as well. All right. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.